Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I am uh, Tudor Parfit, um, Distinguished University Professor at FIU and the Academic Director here at the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. So welcome to the Jewish Museum. And um, today we have uh, a very special guest sitting next to me and who is um, who has become the Dean of the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. And she has written the most riveting book. I've known about her work for probably, I should think almost 20 years, and have admired from a distance. And it's the first time that we have met just a few minutes ago. And it's been a real pleasure talking to her. And it's going to be a great pleasure listening to what she has to say about this truly uh, important book, which looks in detail at a phenomenon which is sweeping the world in a way. Uh, it was last week that we had um, the rabbi sitting at the back of the hall tonight talking about the uh, situation in Africa. And Graciela is essentially talking about a particular um, uh, conversion movement, uh, which uh, took um, hundreds of uh, South American, originally Christians, uh, to Israel, where most of them uh, settled. And towards the end of the book, she talks about the, uh, the general um, phenomenon of what increasingly, I think, people are thinking of in terms of, in a way, um, Gentiles becoming uh, a light sort of unto Israel, rather than Israel being a light unto the Gentiles. It's slightly provocative. Um, on a lighter note, those of you who saw <clears throat> the publicity that we put out, would have read um, Graciela Markovsky in conversation with Professor Tudor Parfit, Prophet of the Andes, which is slightly ambiguous. And it struck home. And so somebody telephoned me from <clears throat> New, um, from Cape Town in South Africa and said that she had seen that I was the prophet of the Andes and that um, I would have a place in the world kingdom that she was in the world government that she was planning for the end of days. I asked about the salary and apparently it was significant. So that's my good news. And in the meantime, Graciela, thank you very much indeed. We look forward to what you have to say. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit uh, about me and how this book came about, just to give you a sense um, of the story and how the story is told. So this is not the story of a religious person. This is not the story of a, um, an academic. It's the story of a journalist. I'm a journalist originally from Argentina. And uh, I live, I've been in New York for a decade, but um, most of my work as a journalist, as a political reporter, I did in Buenos Aires. And in 2003, I was there. Um, I, was, I had just finished my first big book. It was a biography on Jacobo Timmerman, whom maybe some of you know, uh, a very important Latin American and Argentinian uh, uh, newspaper man uh, from the 60s and 70s. And um, I was you know, looking, Googling, uh, was Google around in 2003? I think so. But I was uh, probably, you know, I was navigating uh, the internet and I was looking for, for something else. And I came upon a letter uh, by a rabbi, Myron Zuber from upstate New York. Um, I didn't know who he was, but it had a title that um, caught my attention. It said, Converting Inca Indians in Peru. And I thought that makes no sense. And so I clicked and I found these few pages where this rabbi was asking for a donation for a community from uh, Peru who, was, um, who, who, who were Christians 
and they had converted to Judaism. And it told the story of a very dramatic uh, life um, uh, of, a, of a man called Segundo Villanueva. Um, a lot of the letter I found later was, um, you know, had the, the information was wrong and had exaggerations or some um, errors, but the, the core of the story was the story was right. And so it was about a man from Peru, from the mountains who had uh, abandoned Catholicism and had become Jewish together with hundreds of people who followed him and they were now in Israel. And so at the bottom of the letter, there was a phone number for people who wanted to make donations. I was not interested in making a donation, but I was interested in knowing more about the story. And uh, I just ran to the phone, I called, the rabbi had passed, but his wife, his widow was still alive. And she gave me the phone numbers of the um, family of Segundo Villanueva who were then in um, a settlement in the north uh, of, in the Northern West Bank called Tapuach. And I called, they picked up the phone and two weeks later I was there um, in their home. And in, for the next 15 years, I followed this story back from you know, Peru, to Israel and then to other countries in Latin America to um, report the story that the book is telling. So basically the, 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 the story of the book, the way it's written is based or the focus is one man. It's this man, Segundo Villanueva from Cajamarca, from a very, um, from a hamlet in the Andes actually north of Cajamarca uh, that is in the north of the Peruvian Andes. Um, and this is um, his house. I went there in, 20, in 2015. This is the house um, where he was raised um, in this uh, little hamlet called Rodacocha. Um, it's a, just, you know, 10 houses and it's very rural, very, very remote. That's where the story begins. And it begins in 1927, uh, when he's, he's born there in 1927. In 1944, his father is murdered by a neighbor and he, Segundo, finds a um, Bible, a Protestant Bible hidden in a trunk that had been in his family for generations. He starts reading the Bible and this is when his story really begins and his process of conversion begins. He's, he spends the rest of his life reading this book he opens the Bible as a book. He reads from beginning to end. And um, for the rest of his life, he, he tries to make sense of what of the story that's contained in this book or these books. And he goes through uh, different conversions and through different churches until he finally arrives in Judaism. So the first half of the book is his is, is the is Segundo reading this book with a community, mostly of men, who he um, brings together to discuss um, uh, the Bible and try to understand what is God telling them and how they should live. He realizes uh, quite soon after reading that, he, um, that the Catholic church was not the true church, that um, Sunday or Domingo was not the day that you should keep, that there was El Sabado or the Sabbath, that no one else in Cajamarca knew about the Sabbath. And so he starts looking for other churches and other people who can give him the answers he's looking for. He also finds the name Israel and he knows nobody or no church that has that name. So he's seeking for that name and what it means and where it is in modern words. He thinks for a long time that the Jewish people uh, doesn't exist in the world today, that it's a biblical people and that it has not um, survived. And so he's looking to bring that back um, until he found the Jews in Lima. And so it's, it's really the, the, the book is the story of this quest by this man trying to find the truth as it's written in this book that moved him so deeply when he first read it and, he, and that continued to, to move him for the rest of his life. This is the early 50s, I mean, the late 40s and the early 50s. And what happened at that point is that um, a lot of, Protestant churches, mostly from, from this country and this side of the world, start going into the Andes. And, you know, lots of thousands of missionaries arrived in the Andes and in Latin America and start uh, winning the hearts of a continent that was mostly, that was a mono, almost a monopoly of the Catholic Church. And that moment, uh, it's a moment in which the whole continent starts sh slowly shifting from. Um, a majority Catholic to 
more and more evangelical and Pentecostal and Protestant groups. So he's right at the beginning of this phenomena. So he starts meeting with these uh, American missionaries and others who arrived in Cajamarca, willing to read the book um, with the local people and explain to them that their church is the, is the right church. So he knows, he goes through different churches and different pastors until he finds the one that he thinks is the real one, the true one, because they are the only ones that have the Sabbath which is the, um, or the Sabado, right? Which is the um, Seventh-day Adventists. And they are the only ones in Peru at that time who, who had something that really connected with what he's read in, in, in the Bible. And so he spends 10 years with them. He then moves um, with a, to a more radical group within the Seventh-day Adventists called Reforma Adventista. And, um, but it's basically the same idea, the same church with a more um, strict um, of servants of some of, you know, they're vegetarian and they have the very modest, the way they dress, et cetera. He spends a decade with them, but then he keeps his reading, his Bible reading book at the same time. So he has two different groups. He has this church that he belongs to, and then he has his own uh, group of men who read, who meet twice a week to read um, the Bible. And he finally, and he, they keep having questions and they finally break out with this um, church and decide they need to create their own church because there's there's still a lot of questions that are unanswered. And they come to, he, he's come to the realization that the only name that the true church of God can have is Israel, is Israel. So he creates this church, he names it Israel of God, and he moves half of his um, community. By, the, by then he had more than a hundred people following him and he moved half of them to the Amazon jungle so that they can live in isolation outside of this very Catholic and Protestant world that is not what he's, that doesn't have the answers he's looking for so that they can read and learn alone and, uh, and finally find what they're looking for. So they live in this, um, they create a town, they call it Hebron in the middle of the Amazon jungle, the Peruvian Amazon jungle in the north of Peru. And they live there for a few years. Um, they are mountain people, they were urban, you know, um, street vendors and carpenters, Segundo Villanueva was a carpenter, and they become suddenly, you know, campesinos in the, in the Amazon, and it's, it's really hard. And, um, and they, but they keep their finally, you know, they finally have their own church, and they don't have anyone else telling them what they have to believe, or how they have to read this book, and how they need to worship, and how they need to, um, um, you know, um, follow um, what rituals they needed, etc. They had this church that he created had a combination, had been influenced by different small, very small groups that are not non-existent today in Peru, but that had brought some um, already like a, a vision, a combination, the way they saw it, of the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Jewish traditions and the, and the um, Christian traditions. And they had there is a, a, a period of time where they have um, a, a ritual, they have rituals and they have beliefs that combine both. One day his um, brother goes to Lima and he finds um, a pamphlet about the translation of the Bible into Spanish. There was this seminar about the first translation of the Bible into Spanish during the reform in uh, the 16th century. And so, he comes back, the brother comes back with his pamphlet and Segundo realizes that um, he's been reading a book that is not the original, that he's been reading in translation. He's been paying so much attention to every single word and trying to understand what exactly is, does, it, th th does this word mean and how can he really, um, you know, uh, worship and how can he really live according to these words he had all of the, he had different Bibles in Spanish language, and he had realized, he had seen that there are some different, the vocabulary is not exactly the same in different uh, translations, but he hadn't thought that this was not the original language of the Bible, which, you know, it's not that he didn't know it, that's, that had not really occurred to him. Um, I realized I haven't been showing you the photo, so this was, sorry about that, this was Segundo's mother, Abigail. Correa. This is Segundo when, in the 1950s, Segundo Villanueva. This is in Cajamarca. Uh, that's also Segundo and two friends in Cajamarca when he was still a Christian. 
here is uh, Segundo with his wife, Maria Teresa, uh, soon after they got married. This is also in Cajamarca. And this is a group of, um, this is, that's him up there in the corner with a group of his churches who were part of Israel of God um, at the end of the, when they are just about to become Jewish. So what happened uh, when he realized, um, when he learns about the translation is that he realizes that he needs to find the original Bible. So that's the only way he will really know if he's keeping the right, you know, um, if he's speaking, he's doing exactly what he needs to do and he's living according to God's wishes. And so he goes to Lima and um, he always went to Lima to the biblical society where he could buy different Bibles in Spanish. And he asked for, uh, for the original Bible and he's, you know, in Hebrew. And he's told that uh, they don't have a Bible in Hebrew. And he asked, how can I learn Hebrew? How can I find it? And they said, oh, just go to see the Jews. And he says, so where are the Jews? And, and they tell him that they're two blocks away. He has to just do, you know, two blocks and then find a street and take a, a left turn. And that's where he'll find them. So he finds the Sephardic synagogue of um, Lima. He knocks on the door, the rabbi opens the door. And this is when his, um, the second part of the book begins and the second part of his story. Um, he meets this rabbi who doesn't understand what this man wants. There's here, there's, it, and that's a big part of what's explained in the book. There's a class, a very important class divide and, 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 and a piece of the story of, of his story is that he is part of you know, a mestizo uh, impoverished community and that the rabbi and most of the Jewish community in Lima are upper middle class most of them of European descent. And um, there's, there's a very big divide between these two worlds that, are, that is very hard to reconcile, but especially for, for, the, for the Jewish community. So he's not accepted as part of the community though he and his group decide at one point uh, after meeting with his rabbi that they finally found the real, the real you know, identity and the real um, uh, religion and, and, and exactly that the way they see they are Jewish. So he uh, tries to, after this meeting with the rabbi, he goes back to the jungle with um, a small a, 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 a booklet that uh, children used to uh, study for their bar mitzvah in Latin America, written by an Argentinian uh, writer, uh, tradition, Jewish customs and traditions. And this, they, that's how they start. They start reading this book. They, they learned the basic traditions and customs um, through with this book, they realize that uh, they need to get circumcised through this book, and um, and so he goes back to the jungle with this book and a and a uh, and a Hebrew Spanish um, dictionary, and he announced to his people that they are Jewish. This creates um, a very um, um, heated conversation within the community, particularly the idea of circumcision. The community, the Israel of God, the Church of Israel of God, uh, is split into factions. One faction is completely against circumcision; the other faction is with Segundo. So he loses half of his people in the jungle, and he moves back out of the jungle. This time to the Pacific coast, where he settles with a group of fifty, and then it grows to almost 200 people in time. Um, and they live there with uh, alone, again, in isolation as Jewish, as also the author of Jewish. And they, they learn about this just with the help of a few books that they gather. They, they, got, they, have, they have this book that he found from the, that he got in Lima, and then he gets um, abbreviated version of the Shulchan Aruch in Spanish. And he learns how to live every, moment of his day through this book and they make photocopies of these books because they're not easily, you know, um, they don't have the means to, to get, to buy new, more of these books and they're hard to find in Lima. So they make copies and every family has to study. And for 20 years, this is how they live as Jewish in this, um, you know, outside in this isolated, town outside of Trujillo in the coast of the, in the Pacific coast of Peru, coast of Peru. Um, during those 20 years, 
his um, eldest son learns Hebrew with this dictionary and uh, other, you know, uh, he's, he's, he, he teaches himself to write in Hebrew and he starts sending letters to the great rabbi in Israel because they learn that uh, they, by now they've learned about Israel, that there's a country, they learn the history, um, they, um, they have, they have this great illusion that one day they might be able to go to Israel. And, um, you know, the, the, the book is actually, I'm trying to just do a, a straight line, but the book is really full of um, twists and turns that you don't see coming. There's a lot of moments and encounters and readings that bring him in this direction, but sometimes move them in a different direction. And then they, they come back to this direction. But it's a, it's a, it's a book full of, surprises in a way, it's a story full of surprises because it's really the, it's, a, it's a, actually a mental and spiritual process that manifests in actual action and lives changing, but that is really inspired and by this man's understanding of, of the things he's reading. So it's really uh, about, you know, a group of people reading and trying to transform their lives according to what they understand, they interpret their, they've been reading. Um, they start making, trying to make connections with um, the Jewish community in Lima, as I said, and they get shunned, they're not accepted. Um, they're not, they don't want to help them convert and, and become part of that community, but some people help them and some people start helping them connect with Israeli groups and with, um, rabbis and other people who come to where they live and they they keep on teaching them and and they for example they they knew some songs that they had found the lyrics for but they didn't know the music so they would combine local peruvian music or andean music with those lyrics and things like that so they really is it's a process of learning by themselves and guessing a lot of the time finally they get the attention uh, they 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 there's a rabbi in Israel who um, gets interested in them through a series of connections that take like three chapters of the book. You know, one person takes, gets them to another and another and another. And they finally are found by this rabbi, um, Eliyahu, uh, the, no, sorry, um, Eliyahu Abihail from Jerusalem, who was a lost tribe seeker, who was uh, very much involved, and I'm sure you know his story very, very well, who had um, brought um, um, supposedly lost Jews from um, Asia to Israel. The Bnei Menashe is one of those groups. He had also been part of the um, process of the emigration of the Ethiopian Jews to Israel. And he has a lot of connections with the great rabbinate and with other parts of the religious establishment in Israel. And he goes to um, uh, Trujillo finally at the end of the 80s by then, Segundo and his community had been living a, a Jewish life for 20 years, and they convert them. They convert first 190 some people, and then um, they help them go to Israel after a, 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 some time. And um, of all the places in Israel, they, they bring them to Elon More. Elon More is one of uh, the, the uh, Jewish settlements in the West Bank, in the north of the West, the West Bank. Um, that um, where they could be together and they could be uh, observant the way they saw it. And so they are settled there in um, 1991, 1990. Um, and so he stays there with his family and his followers. And I thought for a long, you know, when I was doing the research originally, I thought that was the end of the story. So, you know, it's a linear story. He ends up um, a success story, they end up migrating to Israel and living as Jews, which is what they wanted in a place where they are, they are accepted as Jewish. But I then I late, later learned that um, when I went to see him in 2005, this is, um, this is actually the moment right before they convert in Trujillo. And that woman right there in the middle is the, the, the wife of one of the um, rabbis who, who was uh, in the uh, conversion tribunal. Um, this is they living in Peru, uh, in this, um, in Trujillo. Um, um, this is that community. They name themselves when they decide they're, they're going to be Jewish and they're going to seek conversion. They name themselves the name Moshe, so children of Moses. 
that's him with, a, with an, another member of his community. And this is Segundo here um, when they just arrived to Elon More in 1990. And this is him with his brother. Um, so when they are, uh, they, they settle in Israel and they think they finally found what they've always been looking for, right? But Segundo starts, um, realizes that there's, um, there's pressure on, their, on everyone who's, who's, who was part of the B'nai Moshe to pick a congregation and to pick a synagogue and to pick a group in Elon More and in Israel. And so they are, you know, they, he, most people do that and he loses his leadership on his own group. People that realize that everybody knows more than Segundo ever knew about Judaism. And so they can't learn from him anymore. Now there's real Jews, traditional Jews, people who have lived entire lives as Jewish and, and rabbis and experts that they can learn from, who can guide them better. So they uh, abandon his leadership. He gets, um, he gets very um, bitter about this, that he has no, you know, no leadership over his community anymore. And that the rabbis come to him to say, you also need to pick a rabbi and you need to pick a, a, a congregation. You need to decide where you're gonna be. And um, he finds that um, really far removed from what he's looking for and the type of community he's been looking for. And he still has questions. Something very interesting that people start realizing about him at that point is that he had not arrived to the destination he's been looking for. He doesn't feel like he already has. So this is, this is it. This is the truth that I've been looking for. He still keeps asking questions. And he, um, one of the questions he starts asking that um, but that, that, you know, irritates the, a lot of the local rabbis in uh, Elon More is um, that he doesn't really um, understand or recognize the oral law. And he thinks that only the written uh, law is, is the law of God and that he doesn't want to follow uh, rabbinical Judaism. And so he starts looking for groups inside of Israel who think like him and he finds the Karaites, he finds the Samaritans, and so he keeps, and so that alienates him with the local um, community that has embraced him. And so he, he becomes a kind of a paria inside of a paria inside of this group. And he ends up leaving with just a small group of family members, moving to another settlement, Tapua, where he lives until he dies in 2008. Before he dies, he goes back to Peru to try to, um, guide the local people. He, he has learned that there's new hundreds of people back in Cajamarca and Trujillo and Lima, where he, that in the years since he's left, had uh, also, you know, discover a desire or a, 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 yes, you know, a desire of being Jewish. And this, most of them were the people who rejected Judaism when he, when they had that converse, that, that fight over circumcision. And so he um, goes back and all those people now want to be Jewish. Some of them in part because they've seen their family members and their neighbors succeed by you know, moving to Israel and have a better life there. And many of them because it just, they continue the same process that Segundo had started. So he tries to lead over them, but they already know because they get letters from their family members in, in Elon More and Tapuach that he's not to be trusted anymore. So they they also decide not to, not to um, get his guidance and they don't even want to meet with him. He, at the same time, is going through Alzheimer or you know, dementia and he goes back to uh, his home in Tapua and soon later he basically loses his mind and he's, he's not able to communicate um, and, and to remember. And uh, I met him at that point in his life. I, I had a conversation with him that cannot be described as an interview because he didn't, he couldn't make sense um, of what he was trying to say. And, uh, and then he died a few years later. So that was the end of the story. I thought, you know, he's, he's now buried in the Mount of, Mount of Olive Cemetery. This is the one when he was in Tapua um, in his seventies. Uh, this is the synagogue that they had um, built in, um, in Trujillo, and this is the community waiting uh, after he, you know, the, like a second wave of uh, um, 
converts that are trying to, to make it to Israel. This is that group. This is one of the leaders of that community. Years later, the years after Segundo um, moved. This is the people he finds when he comes back and they reject him. And this is the women of one of those group. And this is just this is how this is how these um, families learned about Pesach and about you know um, vocabulary. They had the houses are all the houses are covered in these you know um, kind of cheat sheets, you know, um, and and um, and posters, and um, so that they could learn and remember because they're seeing that now everything had names in Hebrew, for example. Um, you know, for, for, for memory. This is another member of, the, of that community and another family in Cajamarca. And this is where he's buried in the Mount of Olives Cemetery. Um, and so that was the end, um, I thought. And then there's an epilogue in the book, which is like a third end of the story, uh, which of course probably is not, is the end up to today, uh, to this day. But what happened after he died is that the groups that had the, the groups who had converted them and helped him in in Israel and in other uh, places uh, start getting um, you know has start start getting contacted by other groups in Latin America who are saying they also want to do this type of uh, conversion. They've been going through this type of process. So I started canvassing and mapping the region. Uh, this was in 2013 when I, or 2012 when I started, and I started find I start uh, to find more and more communities who ha who are not related to this community but are doing exactly the same process. And so these uh, they are called the emerging Jewish communities, emerging Jewish communities of Latin America, and um, they are called emerging not only because they are new Jewish communities but also because they really make they are a parallel Jewish um, life in Latin America because it's there's a million, uh, sorry thousands of people in at least sixty. Um, there's I, I counted sixty communities when I did this map in fourteen countries from Mexico to Chile, who have also you know they studied in Catholicism, went or some type of Protestant evangelical group, and then they did you know by reading the Bible and looking for, um, asking themselves similar questions that Segundo, you know, made fit to himself, they end up finding the same answer in Judaism. And they, some of these groups have been converted. Others are looking for conversion. Some of them have migrated to Israel. Most of them are still in the region. The majority will stay in the region because of, at least for a while, because the politics of conversion in Israel have made it so that it's really hard now if you are part of these groups to 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 make aliyah and to you know and to to get a recognized conversion um, and so there's now more and more of these groups I did the story I covered the story of a very interesting group in Colombia if anyone here is from Colombia in Medellin there's a very large group that is larger than the local traditional Jewish community and everybody who's not Jewish think these are the Jews of Medellin because they're very uh, vocal and very um, open and they receive people uh, in their in their synagogue and their building and uh, and they and the and the rabbi um, has a very important public um, role in that in that uh, city and um, so the at the end of the book and this is you know to connect with the the beginning the the title prophet of the Andes is not because he was actually a prophet or he thought he was a prophet, but because he was this, you know, and this is how the book ends. He was this, um, um, you know, involuntary prophet who actually in reality was the pioneer of a movement that is changing now the religious face of Latin America. And as we know, not just of Latin America, but I really just focus on Segundo and then on Latin America. And um, and by do, while, was, while, while I was doing that, I learned that this was happening also in other places, which is what I'm sure we're going to talk about now. So what's going to happen now is that we're going to have a bit of a conversation. And then when we've finished our bit of a conversation, we'll open it up to a usual Q&A. 
so I think your last point was was very interesting that um, what we're really talking about is a revolution, an incredible revolution whereby uh, Judaism is becoming much more accessible to very many more people. And it seems to be worldwide. So how would you explain that? Let me, I think I have some echo because I'm too close to use. Is it, do you hear? No, is it me? Okay, I think it's better now, right? Right, okay, I think it's good, okay. Um, so, you know, I ask that question to a lot of, um, again, this is the book of a journalist, not of a scholar of Jewish conversion. So I did ask the question, this is what journalists do, we go and ask the people who know. And so I did ask the question to a lot of um, uh, people who were mostly rabbis who were, who were working with these communities to see what they thought, or the people who helped convert uh, Segundo, or the people who are looking at that. There's not a lot of scholarly work on this process and these communities, certainly not in Latin America. I know only of a PDH a student who was doing a thesis on this, and then a group of Israelis who are working on that. There was not a lot of historical, you know, there was not a lot of research on these groups. There is still not a lot of research on these groups, very little. And that can also place it in a historical context. What I see with my, during my reporting is that what has, what happened to this, so th there's different answers I found. I'll tell you all of them. And I, I think some of them are more interesting than others. One is that um, when conversion, you know, this was a continent that was a monopoly of the Catholic Church for 500 years or 450 years. And then when that, when all these uh, groups came in the 50s to convert into other Christian churches, um, a lot of people realized that if they, that they could be something that it was, that they could be something, something different than Catholic. And once they could be something different than Catholic, then they could be whatever they wanted. So there was this sense that there was a freedom to choose your religion that didn't exist before for the longest time since the conquest, you know? And so what I heard some interesting, you know, smart people say was that they were, there's all these studies about how many, the percentages of people in Latin America who are gonna die in a different religion than the, way they, the, the one they were born into. And that is, unprecedented. I think in Colombia it was like 35% of the country or something like that. So that's one thing. And people are converting to other things too. There's a lot of people converting to Islam. There's a lot of people converting to religions different than the ones of their families and their parents. The other thing that I see, I, I've seen done by all of these groups, and a lot of these groups don't know it, didn't know about others. So it's not like there's like, a, you know, a, 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 a deliberate proselytism, just going country from country, just converting people and saying, hey, have you considered Judaism? You know, that's not really how it happened is that a lot of people did this reading and somehow they wanted to go to the original and to the authentic. So there's this search for authenticity, something that was the first, so as you saw, as you read in the book, so many of the, the, the people who end up accepting what Segundo is saying is because they realize that Christianity came out of Judaism. So Judaism was first, and actually Christianity was born inside of Judaism, and it came out from there, and that Jesus, Jesus was Jewish, it's Jewish, et cetera. And so for them, this is a very important point in their realization and in their conversion. And then there's also the internet. People are looking for things and they find these stories. Um, and then the, there are in some communities, there are some proselytism, proselytists, you know, or proselytist efforts. Uh, there are uh, groups of rabbis, mostly American rabbis, but also a couple of Isra Israeli groups, particularly Shaveh Israel, who have gone to find these groups to try to, um, to try to, you know, to, to bring the idea of Judaism and to, and to help them with the conversion. Usually when those groups arrive or those rabbis arrive, it's because the communities are already interested in Judaism. Does that answer the question? Kind of. <laughs> you, uh, you know, you say that you're a, a journalist, not a, a scholar or an academic. I just wish that uh, more scholars and academics wrote books in the same way that you have written this. 
because in fact it's um it's it's great anthropology it's great ethnography you get really under the skin of people and uh, the descriptions are wonderful and it's altogether a great and very very um, serious book I, in a way you've been working on it for quite a, a long time and it's clear that you at some point have felt passionate about the subject and you perhaps still do and um, I know that you your, your mother's Catholic you were brought up as a brought up as a Catholic and your father was Jewish or is Jewish um, so were you trying to were you doing this to please your dad was that uh -huh. the no, I don't need to please my dad. I love my dad, and he's my favorite. <laughs> um, so I did, you know, I did, I did. The, the book doesn't. Um, I don't belong in the book. I didn't. You know, the book is about Segundo and the community. But there's there's a little tiny bit of biographical information at the beginning in the author's note that I thought was relevant for the reader, uh, which is exactly you know the answer to that question. How did I connect? Why was this a story that I wanted to spend so much, so such a long time? Uh, pursuing and 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 doing and it's hard to write uh, if there are writers or reporters here it's really hard to do these global stories from the the global south because there's no fellowships and no grants and no funding and so that's why it really took that long and then I migrated to this country and and um, and it took longer but the, the connection is that when I found when I found that letter originally the Myron Zuber letter in the internet what I was looking for I had done this the biography of Jacobo Timmerman, who was a very important Jewish, um, uh, you know, intellectual um, in 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 a, not an intellectual, he was a publisher, and a journalist, but he was a, an important public figure in Argentina. And but I had spent six years doing his book, uh, writing, uh, working on his biography, and I had learned a lot about Argentinian uh, Judaism and Zionism, and um, he was a very active, you know, member of that community. He really you know, he was, um, um, it was a very important part of his identity at a time of military dictatorships where that was not um, necessarily, you know, the, the welcome. And he ended up being tortured by the military and, um, and, and being, you know, um, um, you know, attacked in part because of his Judaism. So I, while I was doing that book, I started feeling um, more, more and more curious about my you know, partial Jew Jewish identity and about, about the history of my dad and about the history of, you know, Judaism in Argentina, which is very different from most of Latin America, because, you know, I don't know if there's any Argentines here, uh, but Argentina has one of the largest Jewish communities in the world. It used to be the third largest community after uh, you know, Israel and the United States. And so Buenos Aires is a very Jewish city, the same way that New York is a Jewish city. So it wasn't an alien thing. And also, and, and I grew up in, you know, in a, in a family where half of the family were Jewish. And, um, but I had been, my mother had, um, my, my parents had decided that, you know, half of the children were going to be Catholic. And I looked like her. So, and, and my baby brother, um, we were baptized and we were sent to, I was sent to nun school. And my other two brothers who look like my dad, um, they got to go to the progressive uh, public schools and I was very jealous of them. And, um, and I, was, I, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy my uh, Catholic upbringing. It was very oppressive. I hated the nuns. I just, you know, just got out of that, you know, as soon as I, the, the day I finished high school, I just renounced Catholicism and I never in my life went to mass again or anything. And, and then I stopped, you know, um, uh, believing and so uh, in God etc and but but it, it's really a big part of my identity and my last name is very Jewish for Argentine years uh, my grandma who my who was the grandma who I was close to all my life was um, who was Jewish she died at 104 a, few, a couple of years ago um, she used to say nosotros like us when she meant when she didn't mean me when she was talking about the Jewish part of the family and that pained me um, so I was, I was not trying to solve my identity and any type of an identity crisis at all, but I did feel very, I could relate to these um, people who were, you know, who were not seen as the same in their society by, because of the religion they were, they were, you know, um, brought up in and, and, and how that 
for, for them, um, and I did have this, when I met Segundo's family, I met his uh, daughters first, and talking to them in this settlement in, in, in Tapua, and, you know, and he, hearing about their stories, I thought, you know, they've been Jewish for more than 30 years now by, by then, and, and they still have to prove that they are Jewish because a lot of people don't see them as Jewish because of the way they look. So I, I felt some, I felt I could understand at a, at a human personal level, some of the things they, they, they went through. But, you know, of course, I'm a middle-class woman from Argentina. They were, you know, uh, working class or, you know, rural, poor people from Peru. It's a very, very different um, life. So I'm not comparing myself, but, you know, I, I, I could relate in, well, in the search. kind of ambiguity in both cases. So, I mean, it's the ambiguity, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, you talk very sympathetically about this, uh, this group, their poverty and their aspirations. And when finally they, they get to Israel, they're, they're put in dangerous places, which for a lot of people would be uh, politically suspect. And the reasons for putting them there, you describe in the book, you, you say clearly the new Russian immigrants are put in nice parts of, you know, nice, nice parts of Israel, safe, but relatively safe parts of Israel. But these people, as well as the Bene Menashe from India, are put in these dangerous places in the occupied territories close to uh, Palestinian uh, villages, and um, they seem in some way to be used. You don't quite say that, but do you think they were? So the, the, a lot of the people who helped them thought that. And so they, the, the reason they ended up in this settlement in the first place was because the rabbi who converted him was part of this uh, national Zionist movement who was, um, you know, um, religious Zionist movement who, was, who had that as a political agenda, you know, to take all that land um, and, 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 you know, get the greater Israel and the biblical Israel back. And so they were part of a group's political agenda without knowing that. And so some of the people who helped them, uh, that's actually perfect music for what I'm saying. <laughs> and um, so some of the people who helped them were really um, upset about that. And they were, um, you know, there, there, was, there were a group of um, um, non, you know, like a, 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 a Peruvian Jewish um, businessman who had helped them get to where they were and he never visited visited them because he was really against the settlements and the occupation. So they didn't see like that. They, I mean, he, some of them did, his daughter and a few, but most of them were just so grateful and so happy to be there. And it was such a successful assimilation process that they just took that agenda as their own very soon and they became settlers. And uh, Segundo was not interested in that and he wanted out, but by the time he asked out, he couldn't possibly fund it, and nobody was going to give him the funding, and it was too expensive for him to live out, you know, inside the Green Line. Um, so, and he never wanted, he was never interested in that war, in that conflict, but, but his children were, and they all became very much involved, and all of their children went to the military, you know, they served in the military, and they became really, you know, part of the mainstream society. But it was interesting that you mentioned the Russians because the, the, the year they arrived, they were part in Israel, they were seen as, uh, they, 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 they arrived in Israel at the same time that the Russians are arriving. And, you know, and that was way more people and really changed the landscape in, in Israel. And so they were, um, the coverage uh, by Israeli mainstream media was connecting them to, you know, what, what like, so why, why are we bringing, you know, one thing was why are they being taken to the settlements and, you know, just inflaming this, you know, conflict. Um, at that point, the majority of Israeli society was very much against the settlements. I think that has changed now, but that was not the case in the, this is 1990. This was right after the first Intifada also. So a lot of things were happening and, um, and the Russians were a much more important topic because they were just a million people instead of you know two hundred. Um, but but they were there were some uh, columnists and some you know public voices in Israel saying why are they being taken there and also why are they being recognized as Jewish when the Russians are not? Well, because some so many of the Russians had a Jewish grandfather but they didn't live Jewish lives. 
So the, it was kind of the, it was in a way the opposite, right? They were, they were, they, they had the right to Israeli citizenship with, even though they weren't Jewish. And these people who had worked so hard to be Jewish um, were being seen as strangers. And, and also the coverage was very racist, if I may say so, because they were, every single story mentioned the color of their skin and how they look like a portrait from the Andes and they called them the Indianim, which offended them. Um, I, I, I don't think they could understand what they were when they arrived. Well, but the, the thing is fascinating. Um, so what we've heard about tonight has been a phenomenon in South America. And if you look next door, we have a, a small exhibition by Heidi Half. Um, it's photographs of uh, emerging Jewish communities in Colombia. So do have a look at that before you leave. Last week, as I mentioned, uh, the Rabbi Sussman who's sitting at the back um, of the hall was speaking about a similar phenomenon in Africa. And the Sussmans and I were recently in the Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa, and we had many conversations about motivation. And so the question of motivation when it comes to people from very poor countries like the Ivory Coast or Uganda or Gabon or indeed Peru or Colombia uh, going to Israel inevitably gives rise to the question, is the real motivation religious, spiritual, nationalistic, or economic? So what do you think in the context of your group? I think it depends on the people. And, you know, for Segundo, clearly there was, you know, it was just, uh, it was completely religious and spiritual. And um, he's, he's a truth seeker. He's really trying to find the true God and the true religion and the true, um, and the true life, you know, and, and he knows it in his heart that that's contained in this book. So this is his, his story. And a lot of people believe him and then um, share that. And so in, in the case of the Peruvians, there's three waves. The first wave, Segundo and his group. Then there's a second wave, which are the people who have been left behind, who then don't want to follow him who in some cases, and I met a lot of them, they were just, it was a combination, but for a lot of them, it was an economic escape. It was a way to, um, you know, have a better life. I'm an immigrant and I have no, I pass no judgment on that kind of decision. I feel, you know, so many people in the world have done this, in, you know, throughout history and looking for a better life is just the most basic human instinct. So I have no, um, I don't, I don't, I don't have any um, bad, you know, not, nothing bad to say about them. But, but that was their motivation for for many of them. And then, um, then for other groups, in some cases, it started like that. But we were talking at the beginning. Uh, you know, one thing that to me was very um, moving is that even for those people who started the process after Segundo and his group emigrated, um, as a economic opportunistic, you know. Um, process it took so long for them to be converted and and they everyone went goes through a very strict process of conversion so you can't fake it by the time you are you know being converted you need to know so much and you need to have done so many things and living a jewish life takes a lot of action unlike living a christian life which is mostly you know what happens inside of you but living as jewish for these people men changing the way they lived in a very radical way. So I'm doing that every day and learning Hebrew and eating differently and getting circumcised and getting their children. Yeah. So by the time they got converted, they, they had lived a Jewish life for years. So I don't know, maybe it didn't start for that, but then, and then, and then, you know, other, other groups have decided to stay. There's now a lot of, all the groups in Latin America are staying put and they are, and they've been rejected by the local traditional Jewish community. Um, the, those traditional Jewish communities are shrinking because of intermarriage or because people leave, because of the, the lack of economic opportunity in our countries. And so they leave to Miami, they come to Miami or they go to Israel or wherever they go. 
and um, and so less 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 and less people stay living a Jewish life, and then there's a growth in people who want to li live a Jewish life, but they're not being they're not seen as equal, and they're not accepted. So they grow their lives in parallel, and they have you know these separate Jewish lives, and and these are new Jewish lives in a way because they don't have a memory of anything you know they don't have I don't know a Jewish sense of humor or a memory of the holocaust or you know a memory of family members who went through things or nobody died in the holocaust they have they have no history they it's new and so it's it is really be interesting to see what happens in you know if I were a historian I would but I'm a journalist so we can do whatever we want but a historian would say it's too early right to see what's going to happen 20 30 years is kind of too early let's see what happens in uh, in 30 years a lot of people in the traditional jewish communities in colombia in guatemala in puerto rico in you know peru they think because they can't um, migrate it's become really almost impossible then they probably will abandon their jewish lives and um because it's going to get so hard for them and uh, that has happened in some cases, but in, in most cases, it hasn't. Yeah, I mean, I, you're absolutely right. It's going to take some time to know what's happening. Um, we're living at a time of incredible um, change. And one of the things is um, the way in which it's increasingly easy to change from one religion to the next. And apparently, according to Pew, some 51% of the American population who practices some religion has changed that religion in the course of his or her lifetime. Now, this is unprecedented in the history of the world. And so, you know, it's part of a much bigger phenomenon, isn't it, where things like sexuality or gender or class coming from countries like the UK are all, you know, for the first time in history, really up for grabs. You can be what you would want to be. So this is obviously a, an example of just that. Well, thank you very much for those wonderful answers. And I'd now like to invite, I'd like to invite uh, questions from the audience. Yes, please. I worked at Barry University for uh, several years and I had, it's a Catholic school. And uh, I met a lot of nuns, black women, who had converted to Catholicism, who told me that Catholicism had made great inroads in Africa. So it's, it's quite interesting. And these were women who had followed tribal religions, but that was what was happening there. I don't know if you've heard anything about it, but there are a lot of movements going on in the world. Um, you spoke about the um, reaction uh, to this community when they immigrated to Israel, but how about the reaction from uh, the community around them in Peru, especially if it was a Catholic community? I'm sure um, the reactions could have varied from positive to maybe negative. So, Yes, thank you. Yes, so that's, uh, you know, when they moved to the jungle, it's because um, it's so hard to live within a Christian Catholic city uh, still majority Catholic because they were seen as uh, crazy or you know dangerous or uh, and they are they are also um, you know um, they are perceived as um, wrong and um, and a sect and and so they they are also you know uh, rejected by by their own neighbors. I was just wondering, since they were mestizo and there were so many conversos in Latin America, if they ever did DNA tests on them? It's just a yes or no answer. The segundo never did, no. They never, okay. And my other question is, um, since they were sent to El Amore and Tipuach, 
which are in the Shamron Judea, biblical Israel, was um, this part of their consideration since they had learned so much and studied the Bible that that, that could have been a, a consideration as to why they were relocated there. No, when they the, the way they saw it, they they were located. They uh, they chose to go there. They were given some options, and they were told if you go to a big city or you go to um, any of the cities within the Green Line, you will not be able to stay as a community because nobody will accept you en, en masse. We can't bring so many people, so you're going to be dispersed. And also, they were told most people uh, in Israel are not Orthodox uh, Jewish. They are not. Uh, uh, they, they don't, a lot of people are secular and a lot of people won't um, follow the same way you do and, you know, and, or they don't even keep the Sabbath. And so they were given a sense that they needed to be in together and inside a religious community that could, where they could fit right in, because otherwise they would find themselves again in the same situation they were in Peru, you know, living among people who didn't um, see religion the same way they did. Uh, as for the DNA, so they never thought about that until the end. After Segundo died, there's there's a group who helped them get to Israel, uh, not them, but the second waves of Peruvians, and now had a lot, and then they had a lot of influence in the region called Shave Israel, that are based in uh, out uh, of Jerusalem, and they did they created this um, um, literature called Tienes Raíces Judías. Do you have Jewish roots? Um, just trying to re really exploit that, that, that point that there's so many converses and Anusim, you know, uh, there's, there's this long history, very deep history in Latin America of people who were converse or who arrived during the conquista. And then, uh, you know, some of those communities have found their Jewish roots hundreds of years later. That was never the experience of them, but this group um, realized that if they gave that, that a lot of these communities needed some kind of a historical validation and that because it's not really possible to prove whether you come from those communities or not, they started asking them to find signs in their families. Like if there's so many, if there's women whose name were Annabella, I don't know, or if your last name is the name of a Spanish town, uh, which were like names that were normal, normally chosen by lots of conversos. And so, the, and the, so a lot of families said yes, because that there's also many families who have Spanish names and last names, and, but they could give them something to validate their new identity that gave them some prestige that you don't have out of a conversion out of nothing, you know? So some of them, uh, segundo, so th that, that, that became very controversial because some rabbis were helping some, group, some groups in Latin America uh, we're saying that, you know, the idea to, to give them a biological, to get them to go through DNAs and say that they are bi biological Jewish is complicated, you know, given history of Jewish persecution. And so, um, but, but you will find now a lot of these communities who are trying to make that connection. One of the many fascinating topics that you covered in the book was the various views of the regulations under the law of return, the automatic right to citizenship of Jews, and how different people felt about uh, the different waves and whether they should be entitled after being converted, either an Orthodox or non-Orthodox. I wonder if you have any comment on what the current flux is with regard to the law of return in Israel. So that's that's now in, in it's been it's be become really contentious and very um, um, you know it's radicalized that view. So what happened with these communities that when they started going when Segundo went and the, and the, and the in the next 10, 15 years, um, there was um, the, the the law of return was basically, you know, it, it was standings and there's, there was always, you know, a conversation, particularly when the Russians arrived, there was this internal, very important polemic about, you know, let's change that and efforts to change it. Now they're, we're seeing that again. Uh, but what happened after, like in the past 10 years or so, is that the, because of the uh, political um, landscape and the polarization and radicalization of religious groups and the increasing power they've gone in, the, in government, um, the the politics of conversion have become have become really strict, and so 
there's now it's and it's in the hand of more radical you know um, right wing um, um, rabbis who don't accept don't recognize the authority of of most rabbis in the world to convert anyone that is valid in Israel. So they have a list of uh, Orthodox rabbis who have the authority to convert that they will recognize those conversions and it and that list has has been getting really shorter. And also their relationship with the Ministry of Interior and with the Jewish agency has become also way more complicated. And so the door has really, at least for these groups, the door has really, you know, it's, it's, it's shut now. So who knows, you know, doesn't look like it's going in the direction of a more, you know, progressive government these days. So I think, um, you know, that's, that's going to be part of the national conversation in Israel and who gets to be, and I think that's, one of the ways to read this book and to see these stories and to see these these waves of conversions across the world, you know, it's really a new, new, totally new answer to the old question: who's who's a Jew, you know, and who gets to decide, and who who can tell you, you know, and who gets to give you the stamp that says yes, you are or you're not. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I've traveled through Africa. And what struck me by your presentation is how similar the stories are. Because in Africa, occasionally, you would find a leader who was searching. And I mean, I'm talking in Cameroon, a bishop who had thousands of people, like he was an international figure. And then he had the revelation, God of Israel, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and he brought his flock with him. And it's sort of, what struck me is how similar I was hearing stories of this person who serves sort of as, I, not the right word prophet, but sort of as the generator of Jewish identity and Jewish commitment. And um, that's, it's really very, very interesting. It's all over the world. I mean, it's not, just in Latin America or Africa, it's in Indonesia and, a, you know, it's all over the place. But it's interesting because when they first were, when they were first found by the, um, by this um, uh, Israeli rabbi, Abihail, Eliyahu Abihail, um, and I met with him soon after, like in 2000, no, in 2003, the first time, and I asked him if there were any other cases in the world and he had been around the world looking for the lost tribes and you know all his life and he said no there's only two examples and that's in the book he's saying this there's only two examples the case of uganda the abayudaya uh, and then the case of san nicandro in italy in, in italy right after which is an amazing amazing story right uh, during the second world war and they were very similar a leader with who reads the Bible and comes to these realizations and connects with these same similar similar ideas, and then they bring a community with them. Uh, but at, the, at that time, there was no, and I talked to a lot of people in Israel and abroad and in Latin America, and everybody thought this was totally unique. And then suddenly, a few years later, there's this discovery that it's all over. So, uh, we're, I'm, I actually represent uh, Kulanu, which we're now in 33 countries. That's huge where there are emerging groups. The other thing I wanted to comment on is the whole B'nai Anusim thing that's bubbling up. And um, as part of, I, would, I was talking to Professor Parfit, like part of this whole quest of who am I really? And this who am I really question around the world is making people look into their past and take genetic tests and form an identity which was different than what they thought they were born into. Yeah. Thank you. This Thank was, you. it was terrific. Thank you. There's one more. Tutor. There's a difference between lost tribes and Murano Jews, you know, that. Um, they had one tradition, even though they had to turn and become Christians, but they lit candles, they didn't know why, then, 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 then people that convert, because some of these people were Jewish, and then they, to survive, they became Christian, 
And, um, but to convert is one thing and to have been a Jew and find out later in life is another thing. That's what I want to add. Um, I just want to add a, oh, you answer? Yeah, yeah. I just want to add a little bit of a comment, and that is that all over the world, as, as my wife said, people are examining the possibility of Judaism, and, um, it's, and it's almost as if we're going back to the first and second centuries in a debate for uh, which is the right religion for us, Christianity or Judaism, and that I think is something new. And what's interesting about it, it takes place in the background of a very secularized civilization in which strong elements of it have resisted the secularization and are asking religious questions and asking which religion do we think is the most satisfying for us. And some, some from Christian backgrounds come up with, well, Judaism answers our questions better. And so it's just a very interesting phenomenon, and it's it's all over the world in different forms, even um, in the United States. A friend of mine who's a rabbi of a congregation in the Midwestern United States has people of Christian background who come to the synagogue regularly. Um, they're not up to converting to Judaism, but they're examining and re-examining their original faith. And somehow that's uh, that's one of the things that are going on in the world now, and where it will lead and how it will develop, who knows. I just want to ask one more question because my friend was wondering what was the city in Italy that you were talking about? We San Nicandro. You got it? San Nicandro? Yeah. Uh, to the east of Puglia. In Puglia, exactly. At the oldest, from what I've been told, the oldest synagogue in Europe is in Venice. Have you ever heard that? That's what that's what I was told. Does it, it sounds kosher? Okay, well, thank you all very much. I, I'd forgotten to mention that we have some copies of this book. I would recommend very, very sincerely that, that, you, that you buy many of them because it really is a very excellent um, book. And I would also just say that it's, uh, it always causes some pleasure to me to have conversations about the lost tribes of Israel in this particular room, as we have these marvelous um, Art Deco plaques of the 12 tribes that, all, that uh, ornament the, the, the room. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to our speaker. It was really riveting. And please do come and buy some books and have a look at the exhibition. Thanks a lot.